throughout this evening. Um, there's a lot of amazing, amazing uh, queer and trans people of color in my yeah. life. Uh, uh, this piece is for you, for every single one of you. And also during the intermission, somebody came up to me and suddenly started speaking in Mauritian Creole. And for me, that's the, that's the reason why I make art, you know? So this person in the audience, this is for you as well, and I hope it speaks to you. When I tell my mother that I am trans, her lips wobble a minor tremor. But her silence, her silence does not span the three decades of her life. She smiles with compassion, speaking her golden heart, soft, warm, and welcoming, a resilient glow. She does not need to tell me about our history. Our lineage is one of silence woven in between our intimacies. But her body, her brown, exhausted body speaks of her childhood. I see in her old eyes the dirty gullies of Port Louis, grey, dusty, and stifling under the burning sun. I see in the drooping ridges under her cheeks the cold embrace of banyan trees when the summer heat became too heavy to bear. I see in the shakiness of her lips, melted dog gluing itself to her eight-year-old feet. In the streets of the capital, Poverty was a sticky business. Melted blackness stained itself to the soft skin of childhood. I see in my mother's shiny forehead, in those beads of sweat that placed themselves evenly on her skin, a child pushing a putu cart. That a putu, that cake that her godmother made diligently with freshly crushed coconut and ground rice, and that she pushed in a cart every single day of her life all the way to City Saint Croix. When I look deep into the battered trenches under my mother's eyes, I see copper coins shifting hands, churchgoers, beggars, children, sex workers, faithful and as faithful, unwrapping sweet round coconut and ground rice cake from the humidity of newspapers. They dip it in hot black tea, an everyday ritual of Cité Saint Croix. When I tell my mother that I am trans, her withered hands shake like dried twigs forgotten by history, but her silence, her silence does not span the three decades of my life. She smiles with compassion, speaking her golden heart, soft, warm, and welcoming, a resilient glow. She actually tells me, it's okay, don't worry, Kama, people like you have always existed. Her heart beats ghost images, fragmented narratives frame her haunted soul. She tells me that we come from a history and a culture where the men women and the women men have always existed. She tells me that those people are present in all of our myths and our religions, in our everyday life, and for as long as she can remember the Viedimun, the elders, always spoke of the women men and the men women. She then tells me that she spent her childhood with a neighbor who was of my kind. But she then closes her heart. She stitches it back to darkness. She frets the unspoken between our bodies. Our lineage is one of silence woven in between our intimacies. But every night, every night since that day, I dream of my mother's childhood. I dream of her neighbor, this person who was of my kind. Sometimes I call her Sarika. Sometimes I call her Devika. Sometimes I call him Devakumar. Or sometimes I call him Pajani. But most of the times I like to call her Lalita. I like to think and dream of Lalita, with round shoulders and raven curly hair, a tad too greasy but that still bounces up and down the nape of her neck when she walks in the morning sun. I like to dream of Lalita with a flat nose and a blood red bindi on her forehead as she wraps her rotten body in a faded grey shawl to go to work every morning. Lalita rubs coconut oil in her jet black hair every Sunday. Lalita eats rice, dal, and pickles during the week, and on weekends, she treats herself to some dried salted fish cooked with onions, fresh thyme, and tomatoes. And bon chirogai au poisson salé. 
Lalita works in a tobacco factory in the capital city with all the poor women whose husband had died in some obscure war that nobody really knew about. They all went fighting for the British and never came back. In her lunch break, Lalita does not step out with the other women to roll tobacco in small newspaper pieces that then burn their darkened lips. Instead, she stays at her workstation. She sits silently and prays to Goddess Durgama, or sometimes when she feels tired and the heat becomes too unbearable, she sits in a chair. She closes her eyes and her hands cover her, her face, her elbows, her bosom and she takes a really quick nap. When it gets hot in the capital city, Lalita takes out a white embroidered handkerchief from her pocket and she wipes the purse of sweat from her forehead. On Sundays, Lalita makes fruit pickles that she dries on her roof, watching attentively just in case the crows come to eat them and sometimes, if she's in a good mood, she'll give some dried fruit to my mother and her sisters. Lalita likes flower patterns and she likes embroidery. She has a radio set in her room and she listens to the news every morning and to Hindi songs every evening. Lalita has a lover. But does Lalita have a lover? I'm not sure whether Lalita has a lover or not. But this is Lalita. This is Lalita, and I dream about her every night, imagining details that make her a little bit more real every day. She draws her life like a moving sculpture, a figure only ever so ephemeral, becoming and unbecoming herself with every dream. When I tell my mother that I am trans, she does not tell me about Lalita. Instead, my mother tells me that she is, that she's an uneducated woman. She tells me that she feels much pride, that I went to school, that I can read and write, that I speak English and I speak French. She tells me that because of her lack of education, she does not have the words for it. But she tells me that she understands that people like me have always existed. She calls me Zum Fam, which in our local language means man, woman, with a hyphen between the two. Zum Fam. Zum Fam. Zum Fam. Zum Fam. I take pleasure in being a Zum Fam. A woman man being neither Zum nor Fam and yet being both and being none navigating this middle passage in the space between Zum and Fam that instars this where travelers like me find their truth this undefinable space that structures my diaspora that hyphen that holds and wraps my gendered experience Zum Fam Zum Fam Zum Fam But then my mother tells me that I shouldn't call myself a Zum fam. That she is an uneducated woman and she does not know those things, but that she is happy, she's happy, she's happy that I have an education, that I can call myself trans, that I have the words and the language to name and describe the discomfort of my gender, the constant shiftiness of wanting to tear off my skin, and along with my skin, my birth certificate, my passport, and all those other state-sanctioned papers that dictate my gender. But deep, Deep inside me, there is a voice that speaks. There is a voice that speaks in the uneducated tones of my mother and embroiders itself from pore to pore onto the surface of my skin. There is a voice that does not have the words or the vocabulary, but it reverberates goodness and music into my body, my heart beating the drums of my ancestors. There is a voice that did not go to school, that did, does not speak English or does not speak French, and yet echoes wisdom and truth in my bloodstream, like a wave of the oceans that witness the loss of our languages. Mm. Wow. And that voice tells me, in the uneducated tone of my mother, 
that I do not need an imperial language to define myself, that I do not need to be trans in English or in French, that colonialism has already wrapped itself like a girdle around my lungs, and that even though our lineage is one of silence woven in between our intimacies, this voice exists deep within and speaks like my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother and those generations of women and femmes who fought to keep our language alive and passed it from generation to generation. So mother, I will listen to your uneducated voice. I will listen to the voices of our ancestry, those that dictate that I speak out loud. And when I'm done tearing off my skin, and along with my skin, my birth certificate, my passport, and all those other state-sanctioned papers that dictate my gender, I will take every single piece of torn skin and paper. Yes. I will paint them in gold and I will stick them back together <laughs> with melted diamonds as I so desire. And I will call this armor, this fierce femme armor, I will celebrate an unbreakable, an unshakable object of love that I will hold together with respect and dignity. Yes. And I will call it Zomfam. Zomfam! <laughs> When I tell my mother that I am trans, her lips wobble a minor tremor. But her silence, her silence does not span the three decades of my life. She does not need to tell me about our history. Our lineage is one of a secret language. Our lineage is one of a secret language, a long lost secret language that we weave in between our intimacies.